them. Uh, and it was something I could not, like, I was like, this is never going to happen. And it did happen. So we did a game together with NASA that was played by 16 million people. One, six, 16. Wow. And it was, I, I wouldn't imagine. And it's just like, you go and you try and you really have to take the risk. It's like, it's going to, like one of X shots like that will, will work out. But if you, if you keep trying and if, if, if you just go and give it a shot, there is like, what's worse than just hearing no right it's not so bad so if, if i knew that i would i would even double down on that earlier than than we did so we had this amazing streak um of part, global partnerships and brand partnerships like guinness world records and many others that then resulted into an award we got as um one of the 100 most disruptive uh brands in marketing which we were not even in marketing or <laughs> gaming company so it was just the confidence, like no matter where you come from, uh, and um, it, like Eastern European startup, woman led, doesn't really matter. Just you, you can do that. So the confidence level was one of the main, I think, like realizations. Like you just take it. <laughs> you can absolutely go and take it. <laughs> And we're back. Welcome to Founder Insights Podcast by Animoca Brands. I'm Rich Robinson, entrepreneur in residence at Animoca Brands, your host. And I am pumped today to welcome to the pod a kick-ass, world-class founder and builder. We just saw each other in Singapore. Welcome to the pod Founder, CEO of Gamey, Bozina. Bozina, welcome. Really. Thank you so much. What an introduction. <laughs> I'm a big fan. I'm a very, very big fan. And I'm really excited to peel back what you're working on right now, your kind of vision, a little bit of a origin story of the company, and also your, your journey uh, along the way. So uh, yeah. let's get started, shall we? Uh, you know, Gamey was uh, acquired by Animoca, you know, uh, way back in the day when Web3 was not nearly uh, that uh, that sexy and it became sexy and maybe it's not so sexy, but it's going to become sexy again, Web3 in a big way. <laughs> and uh, you've had it. you've had an amazing and you're going to be one of the catalysts for that sexiness coming back. Tell us about what you're working on right now. You guys just have a, a recent launch and I'd love to hear about that, please. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm leading a mobile gaming company called Gamey. I'm one of the co-founders. We have been together for over eight years and we have been building different products that connect people through play distributed on mobile games. And uh, the, the most, most recently, the product that we're working on is called Beast Arcade, which is a, a mobile game, entertainment first, fun first. But it has a mission of introducing people into the concept of digital ownership which sounds very beautiful. We absolutely love it, but it's, it's a little bit abstract and complicated for a person who just plays mobile game, right? So we were thinking really how to, how to put it. What is, what is the right story that is not overwhelming and does not sound too complicated or even like we, we didn't want to offer a solution to people that wouldn't necessarily feel there is a problem with mobile gaming, right? So we're like, how do we, how do we put it? So in the most recent launch that is actually like 10 days ago, we, we added a meta game on top of our game. So there's like a bunch of different mini games you play against friends or strangers, basically PvP. And on top of it, there is a meta layer where there is a character that evolves. Um, you feed it, you make it unique and yours, and eventually you can mint it as an NFT. So the idea behind that is as, as a normal gamer that maybe only heard about Web3 but doesn't really know anything, you would only care about digital ownership if you care about the game. Because if it comes as an abstract con con concept without any substance, it's very complicated. So this way, we're, <laughs> we're giving it a face. <laughs> we're taking people through the evolution stage. It's theirs. They're customizing it. And whenever they're maxing out their character, they have a possibility to make that an NFT. 
And here is the moment where people have spent time and effort building the character, it's custom, it's unique. And here is the space to tell the story of, okay, it's an NFT, it belongs to you. What does it mean? Beautiful. I think it's brilliant. It's an excellent thesis to be able to bridge people in and get them excited about the, the core gameplay. But this is something that's appended on top of it, but becomes really theirs. And then they become more and more invested and then they get more and more excited about it. And then that can kind of get them over the hump of like, okay, wow. All right. I need a wallet. I need to like, let's, let's dive deep into this. I can actually own this. That's pretty awesome. I, I really love the idea of that. It's very thoughtful. And you guys started doing games eight years ago when it was like not even possible to do things on chain. So you guys are able to bring all of that skills and expertise into in, into this. That's great. T t tell me about the, the kind of brainstorming behind the scenes with the team about some of the things you were thinking about how to, how to do this and how you came upon this. Yeah. Like, so we're, we're very excited about web three and all the principles, right. Uh, uh, giving control to players and the digital ownership and, and everything around it. But you get to a point when you really go deeper and deeper. And we have historically, we have a very large user base of mobile gamers that are global uh, they're in millions we have seven billion gameplays on our platforms so we're looking whoa seven <laughs> that was a b i didn't billion. even know that seven <laughs> billion yeah that's a nice neighborhood wow yeah, yeah yeah so we're like we're looking at a large global base and a super huge engagement levels and these are gamers that may not necessarily identify themselves as gamers right you if like if we had a chance to call them like do you identify yourself as a gamer i don't know if that would fit like they would be like i'm just like having fun i'm just playing so these are more like on the casual side and always within any even like casual gaming audience you always go and have people that take it very seriously they know everything about the game they're super good at that game and you have a community that emerges around it right so some people take it like very light and then some people go beyond and they are absolutely engaged they're waiting for everything that you build and this has been the case ever since we launched the company so we were looking into the thesis was and now i'm coming back to the origins of the company but we still keep the thesis for the current product is then just beyond the individual content beyond the individual games what is it that make people stay around enjoy and build something that's bigger than that, right? And it, the answer was always community, of course. They feel as they're part of something bigger. And then there are different elements, like what is the glue of the community? Like, why do they stick together? So it's, it's having fun. Um, it's some type of a culture. You can, you can achieve that by different gamification layers, by social elements in your game. And most recently, you can also help that with the ownership. So ownership, and being part of something that you commonly share is the ultimate, it, it appears to be the ultimate glue. So why do people stick around and why they feel there is more than just individual games? This is our thesis. And it has been like that since the, I don't, beginning of the company, but only approximately three years ago, we started looking into and doubling down on the ownership part as like additional layer. And it's just like super exciting. We really love it. Wow, that's fantastic. I want to peel back two things. One is, it's commonly said, biggest community in the world, 3.2 billion gamers. But you are very honest in that I would say many of them wouldn't necessarily identify as like, oh, I'm a gamer. Because a gamer would mean like, oh, I'm just basically EDSW, click, 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 right? I'm like hardcore. Um, whereas so many gamers are, um, you know, my wife loves to do, I think a lot of female gamers like to do games that are very much, you know, kind of like uh, distracting them and just, you know, Candy Crush and things like that. Am, am I, am I gaming or am I really kind of giving myself self care even, right? Or there's my, my, my children, you know, have, have games, but I don't think they would, you know, my little seven year old, she's not a gamer, but she plays some educational games. Right. And um, that, that's, that's really interesting, but I love your point about the ultimate glue. Like we talk about community a lot in Web3 and you already have an existing community, but now you're like, I'm going to solidify that community and deepen it with ownership. Can, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like what, you, what you've uh, seen 
around that and what you envision? So I think the most, the most important learning we had is that imagine when we, and we, we can talk about the story as well, but when we decided back in 2020 to become part of Animoca Brands, one of our motivations was to really understand how can we do that and finding somebody on the market as an industrial leader, perhaps to join the forces and help us figure out. Because like if, if you as a team, and that was the case, you're fully sold into it, you're on board, it does not mean that your millions of gamers are on the same page, right? So you have to figure out the storytelling and how do you make them as excited as you are? <laughs> and that ideally happens uh, through the gaming experience. So um, the, in, during our journey, we have done different experiments, like how do we introduce this concept? And we launched some of the products that they were like NFT first, you get a character, then you play with it with different tests of interoperability. But then we learned that by doing so, uh, we are putting, we are addressing the community that's already prepared, like the Web3 ready, right? Because you're opening the doors already with these concepts. Like this is an NFT, it's interoperable. And <laughs> it, it was a little bit too, like the difference between people who understand and are already in compared to everybody else of, of our millions of users was really, really the gap was, was big. So the idea behind Beast Arcade, Beast, uh, Beast Arcade was, can we make it easier, more, more digest, digestible uh, for the millions of players that may not, not identify themselves as like Web3 ready or gamers. And that was just taking it rad, gradually, really making people like the game and when they care about the game. And then you can ask yourself, like, how, how do I, like, what is the care about? Like, how, how do I identify, right? What is the mechanism I can use? And we decided to use a character because that, that's a thing. <laughs> People do identify with different I, personas, uh, gaming identities. So the character uh, is an easy thing people understand. And then offering the ownership of that you care about is something that we see is able to take people through that journey of understanding uh, there are items in games, usually digital, you don't own them, but it can be different. Love it. Yeah. So my sons who are big gamers, you know, if you talk to them about a game, like, of course, the last few levels were the most exciting and challenging and the, you know, the fight with the final boss was, was great. I had to do it, you know, 300 times until I actually finished it. Uh, but if you take a player and just put them on level 27, which is, where they had them will have the most fun without introducing them up to the levels, then, you know, they don't have the, they don't have the, the capacity to be able to enjoy it and uh, along the way. So yeah, it's really, it's really uh, quite brilliant. I think it's almost like kind of like a digital pet in a way where you become really attached to this, to this one character. And then you're like, okay, I'm ready to learn how to mint it. Just like I'm ready to learn how to, fight the final boss right and getting on Meta, getting on metamask is kind of like fighting the final boss sometimes right <laughs> we also learned the hard way right now arcade uh, will turn very soon to 3.5 million players so that that is already a pretty significant number for a decentralized app um there will be first people minting their beasts very soon I, when when we started with arcade uh, over a year ago we had this big idea, let's, let's give people like, let's decentralize a little bit, some decision making, let's give people power to vote, which in Web3, it comes naturally to us like, yeah, absolutely, that should be the case, right? But then we, we realized that the barrier of taking people off the, plat off the gaming platform into voting systems, have them connect wallet, it was like the barrier was so high. <laughs> that like, like they just dropped off we were giving them power and they were like no <laughs> so then just like sticking to sticking to like some discord was a lot easier so that was one of the moments when we realized we have to really take it a lot slower and find out something a lot more digestible beautiful love it part of the whole uh evolution and you're really pioneering something uh obviously that's resonating um you have all the game skills game development skills, you know, live ops and the existing community. And it seems to be getting some really solid traction in, in a time where um, the community needs the web three broader community needs some wins on the board. So uh, congratulations. And as the traction builds and as more people mint and what do you see in the, in the roadmap, what can you share in, in the, as the game evolves even more? 
Yeah, we will we will see first people minting their characters and we will soon announce um, next utilities of the characters, how they can use them. So just to tease it a little bit and not to spoil it too much, uh, there is going to be a big gaming event, online event that will be hosted on uh, in, within our product arcade where we're bringing a bunch of partners from Web3 Space and brands together. So they're chipping in with rewards and there will be new games. So everybody's invited to uh, come participate and play to earn some of these rewards. We always see the rewards as invitations to go and explore more projects within Web3 Space because our focus is to be the first step into Web3, the onboarding. So we're attracting mass gaming audience and then we're sending them over to the next journeys to different other Web3 games and projects. So that's, that's the ideal case. And the, the beast characters, uh, they will play a role. So owning them is better than not owning them without spoiling it too much. <laughs> that's great. That's great. That's, that's enough alpha to get people excited and to want to participate in that. And then I think once players see other players that have beasts that have some kind of advantage, then they're like, oh, inner cookie monster say, me want, me want that. How, how do I get that? And then it creates this mo momentum. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Excellent. Can, can we go back a little bit? You talked about this uh, origin story eight years ago. You start the company. Uh, tell us a little bit about your co-founders and how, how that started and about your journey along the way. So then we have been together over eight years, so that's a long-term relationship almost. Forged, <laughs> forged by fire. Yeah. Uh, we we get along really well as we have the role split, so that was pretty obvious from the get-go. So one of the co-founders focuses on user experience and product. One of the other ones uh, focuses on technology and leading uh, the development. And I'm just making sure everybody is on the same page. So great. you're the bad, badass lady boss. And, and how, how did, how did you guys uh, start to work together? How did you meet? What was the discussion to be able to start this company? So it was, uh, uh, the actual genesis was that I was working uh, for Google on uh, YouTube uh, launching partnerships and monetization across European markets. And prior to Google, uh, I co-founded different consumer tech uh, companies. Some, some of them failed, some of them uh, successfully exited. And then I spent some, I think it was almost four years working for Google. And uh, somebody uh, really smart told me once entrepreneur, always an entrepreneur. So I kind of felt this much while working at Google and felt like I really have to, I, I really have to go back to building. Uh, because even back then, Google was uh, already an amazing company, but big enough to, so that you're just part of a big organization. So I, I decided to leave without without a plan. So I, I left Google and I remember that there were some, um, some of my former colleagues telling me that if you leave Google from that level of job, you have to prove yourself within a year uh, because nobody leaves Google. <laughs> And like, if, if you don't really prove yourself, like people will be like looking at your CV or career, like which, what happened there? Was she fired or something? And I, like, I was like, I don't really have a plan. And like, I'm hearing those stories. What am I going to do? And I wanted to take some break, some like mind space, but that did not happen because I met my co-founders and they had this idea of a gaming platform basically on paper, like super simple wireframes. And I got really excited as, um, I used to consider myself a gamer, now a more casual gamer, but I was, I was a really passionate gamer. And uh, uh, this, this was something I felt I really wanted to make happen. So instead of a break after Google, I went straight into um, starting a company. How did you meet your two co-founders? So we're, uh, we all live in Prague and there is a tech and startup community that gets, uh, gets to meet quite quite frequently on like different events or like mentoring or feedback. So I, I think it was one of those events where we met. Fantastic. We did a small project before. So there was a trial <laughs> and this works. And then, yeah. I love Prague. I was there, as I told you, as an English teacher right after the revolution. And it is the city of a thousand spires unscathed by the two world wars. And it has this, like, if I may, from my perspective, it has this sort of like Germanic kind of like work ethic, but it has this joie de vivre of the 
uh, Mediterranean. It's this beautiful combination. And Prague's actually more west than Vienna. So it's really like part of, you know, the, the, the heart and history of Europe. And I still remember... That's that's what you hear oh, in the wow. in the subway. I'm I'm sure my accent well is it sounds like fingernails on the chalkboard, but uh it was such a formative time being in in Prague for me. And I feel that there really is this strong entrepreneurial drive. Can you tell us a little bit more about the tech scene in in uh in Prague in the Czech Republic and where you've where, where you've grown this amazing company? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Prague is very vibrant. Uh, there were companies, uh, especially tech companies in security and B2B, some very strong ones uh, that um, a attracted a lot of like traction investors, but also uh, hitting the global scene. We would like to see more of consumer ones. We have several gaming companies, probably the most prominent one coming from Prague is Beat Saber. I think that's the most successful VR game in all history. So uh, a friend of ours <laughs> is the designer of Beat Saber, so we're really proud about, really proud of what they have achieved. And, and funny you mentioned that Prague is more west than Vienna, as at the beginning of the tech scene and the startup scene, I think many entrepreneurs here felt that we have to prove ourselves like twice that much compared to, I mean, like companies that are born or originated, for example, in the U.S. or Western Europe. So. It was always this feeling like we have to prove ourselves and build the name of the kind of Eastern European tech scene, even though it's more worse than, uh, than Vienna. And, and we had a little bit of feeling like that as well. Like if we want to build a global, global company, what, do, what does it take? Right? So it's, it's not only, it's not only the product, the product can be great, but you have to find a way how to, how to sell it, um, how to introduce it to global audience. And it, it was one of the big, I think, topics and journeys that we went through as a company is like, how do we make a small uh, company take a global stage? And uh, maybe some of the things I, I, I should mention was that it's the, even if you have like a super small team, you know, we were, I don't know, like 10, 12 people. And we were thinking about like, how do you really make a global footprint? Like, of course, if you grow, if you grow your audience large enough, somebody may notice, but how can you how can you grow even even more? Like, how can you hack it, right? So we were thinking about, okay, maybe we find a global company and we pitch them something they really like, so we would form a partnership. So we were we always thought about partnerships. And one of the first one we did was uh, taking our gaming thesis, connecting people through play, web-based, and we pushed, pitched uh, a gaming product to messengers. So we went to Facebook, we went to Telegram, we went to Viber with prototypes, like this is how gaming inside messengers could work. And um, guess what? Um, all of them, all three of them launched what we pitched. So <laughs> we were one of the, we were one of the 10 global companies that launched instant gaming inside Facebook. We were the first company to launch gaming inside Telegram and the first one to launch gaming inside Viber. Um, coming from Eastern Europe, small team, you know, just like going really going outside and pitching ideas like this is how we can build business together. And it worked out. So we were like, whoa, that's great. <laughs> Let's keep going. <laughs> Fantastic. I want to peel that back. You know, the first gaming company I started back in 2001, we were doing SMS games. Uh, we partnered with a company that became Glue Mobile and then Glue Mo Mobile ended up acquiring the company. Um, called called MIG Mobile Internet Games in, in China, MIGLA. And two other exits that I had were partnerships that turned into investments that turned into acquisitions. And so that that's a brilliant strategy, but also messaging. Let's talk a little bit about messaging and gaming because all the 25 years I spent in China, once WeChat launched and mini games, I saw the incredible, we talk about having really, really glue around community. I mean, a messenger is the most used app, of course. And the mini games on WeChat, that really hasn't been fully replicated around the world. But now Telegram is launching with, uh, you know, they have their own uh, blockchain as well too, and their own wallet, and they're doing mini games. I mean, I think that's a super exciting uh, area for, um, you know, exploration. What, what do you think about that? 
Well, it's it's something that's uh, that's quite close to me that we have really uh, hands-on experience uh, with launching games inside messengers. When we discuss the glue thing, uh, so the social connections and your social network and your friends is is one of the elements, right? And if you have people connected into a messenger, being able to play games directly within the social context is really powerful. So this was something behind our thesis, how we pitched the games to the platform I mentioned. Um, it, it would have been even more successful if it were not for Apple, <laughs> because as you can, as you can imagine, if you, if you, if you take uh, an app such as WeChat or Telegram, Facebook Messenger, and if you start plugging in services inside, it's kind of a bypassing store or app store. So you don't necessarily need to go back to store and download apps if you can stay within one, right? So this is something that uh, we know that uh, that Apple was actively actively pushing against and was stopping some of the growth of different services and especially gaming inside the messengers. It did not happen with WeChat, I don't know why, but it happened with all of the others. <laughs> so they were stopped by Apple when Apple said no, less or less visible. But uh, I, I know that Telegram is doubling down on it. We have uh, games inside Telegram since 2016. Uh, it's fully organic, vital growth. There is still 2 million monthly active gamers play and share our games in Telegram. And we're now looking into how, how can we make that even better, uh, looking at the recent um, wallets and uh, blockchain integration possibilities inside Telegram. But that's more like a wild card. We have an existing audience and looking into, can, can we make that better? I think that wallet, I test, I test drove it at CoinFest Bali here uh, with Tone. And I think that will be a game changer because I tasted it in China once WeChat launched their WeChat Pay and it becomes part of the, and that's what really red pilled me deeply into Web3 is that I see this wallet right now. It's, it's a little bit clunky and it's underused. But once wallets are integrated into everything, it's an incredible lubrication and magical pixie dust that just makes everything work so much more smoothly. And it really only exists in China in, in a way where uh, it's difficult to understand unless you really have it. But I think Telegram with its huge number of users and you sideload the APK and you don't really have to go on the app stores you know, they, I think there's a, a chance for it to, to really flourish. Yeah. Unfortunately, app stores are still very, very powerful. And yeah, they, they, by Apple, they basically has their foot on the brake. So how much we can, we can do so. Tell us a little bit about that, about the, you know, the discovery of apps on, on the app store is so huge and therefore Google play and the, you know, Apple store, Apple app store, you can't, you can't avoid it. How, how do you, you know, yeah, we had one. We had one uh, interesting experience. I think we shared this experience with Animoca Brands that we had one of our products deplatformed in the past, mm. as we were innovating so hard that we crossed the line <laughs> and could not be taken back. <laughs> that uh, the thesis of that product uh, back then was, uh, you know, I, meant, I mentioned I used to work uh, on YouTube, right, in, in um, at Google, and the idea was looking into uh, how the videos are so easily shareable and streamable inside an app. So we were thinking that should be the same with casual or hyper casual style games. You, you should be able to download an app and then without any friction to move easily from one mini game to another. So like we built a streaming for those games and um, basically a catalog, even possibility for like third party creators to launch game there. And we kept the social login of the messenger. So you would play within the context of your friends. So that, that was really vital. Like, super successful people absolutely loved it it was more like a social network full of games uh but at one moment we got a message from apple saying uh you're bypassing app store so that th the idea was that you know instead of going and download individual apps in app store people would stick with our product and they would play one game after another without having to go back to apple which apple did not like and they gave us a warning we tried to follow their advice but eventually there was no advice uh, they said uh, it's a business decision they kicked us out of app store and made us lose uh, the growth uh, millions of users made our vc investors panic of course and make us really think hard what do we do next because we just lost as a quite small vc funded company we just lost our product 
So that was, <laughs> that was my, my experience with like innovating so hard that you push the wrong button. <laughs> and then, well, you have to think what's next. Absolutely. And Animoca brands in the early days as well, too. You know, I think five of the top 20 apps and then just completely deplatformed all five apps, no justification, just goodbye. And I think that was one of the things that drove, you know, Yat and team to start to explore alternatives, just like Vitalik, you know, lost his wizard's powers on the, you know, World of Warcraft and he started Ethereum. So I think, you know, but, but now the fact is that it's really still very important to be part of the, part of the app stores. I mean, it's, it was the, 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 the stores and the mobile uh, were really behind the growth of content consumption and mobile gaming, right? So if we speak about the 2 billion gamers that may or may not identify themselves as gamers, that was thanks to mobile. And just the ease of distribution helped that a lot, even like both sides, right? As a content creator, you're able to push uh, the game and have that distributed across countries, even for example, worrying about like, do I have to tax my revenue and register for tax in various different countries? These are like the small things that are like major, right? If it were, if it were not for, for uh, this infrastructure behind stores, uh, how, how would it be possible? Uh, so they are still very important. However, I think they are sticking to all business models that are somehow very brutal. And sometimes the guidelines are written so uh, that are open for interpretation, meaning that you're never sure if you're on the good or bad side, which I think is a little bit unfair because the more transparency uh, the industry has, the, the more they can rely on like, okay, I can build this. So right now, there is a bit of a like parts of Web3 is okay to use an app store, parts of Web3 is not okay, but it's so not unclear that it makes it really hard to build something without with with some confidence, like we, we will be fine with this. Mm. Yeah, indeed. I think you're right that the discovery part is so crucial. I mean, it's not so much, you know, there's multiple strengths in an app store. Hey, we vet all of the apps to make sure that they're safe and we help you to recommend and choose the best apps and we help you to update and we help you to do payment but it's really about the, you know the discovery is the most core thing and nobody's been able to really disrupt that up to now but i believe because payment is so core to web3 and the you know the vetting and you know, creation of an app store is not really technically you know it's not trivial but it's not that difficult and i think there could be room in the future for that to be completely disrupted once people actually do get a taste for dApps and, you know, but that's, that's another story, but up until, up until that happens, <laughs> you, need, you need the discovery. You know, I think that we have different roles, right? So we're looking into growing the web three space. And when, when you look at some uh, mobile apps or mobile games that have elements of web three, you may think, but that's not really like web three disruptive, but you, you, like you always have a scale. So you have some products that go really light because they want to be friendly to people and have them make the first step. And then you have, you have products or games that go really hard or completely decentralized and on chain, but they have to go off stores because that's just not possible. But there, there is a scale of these and, and each of them has a really strong role. We should not expect we should not expect from single product to solve all of that, like be, be simple, intuitive, accessible to anyone with a mobile phone. And at the same time, be really complex, completely decentralized and uh, have all the web three principles at, at the same time. Right. So we need a portfolio and a scope of products that will cater to that different stages. Well said, well said, let's uh, dig a deeper into your uh, journey. Can we talk about some of the lessons as an entrepreneur and some of the lessons around uh, working at, at Google and how you've kind of brought the best of those skills and learnings to what you're doing now? <laughs> I guess I always uh, like building and creating things. My favorite, uh, my favorite classes in school um, were mathematics and art. So I was always looking, is, is there a way how I can use both without having to pick? <laughs> so, and then I, I figured, well, you can do that. You can do that in gaming. So it's kind of uh, art with math. So. That's beautiful. I've <laughs> never, I've, I've never heard it uh, succinctly, uh, you know, described that way. That's beautiful. It is math and art. 
and it completely aligns with your, your interest and passion. That's beautiful. So then, then you start this, this company prior to Google. Tell us, tell us a little bit about that journey and some of the scabs and calluses and scar tissue like armor that helped you go back into <laughs> battle again. I mean, we, we, we started the company with my former university classmates, uh, even prior the term startup was, was used in this country. So we, I don't think we even called that as a startup. We just, uh, uh, we just put together ideas and we started building. It was, uh, it's actually still a life product. It's a peer to peer marketplace. So it's visualization of real estates on, uh, Google maps. So you can do location based search and then peer to peer renting and selling. So there was a little bit um, looking into, okay, the real estate markets and the agents are charging way too much. It should be more open and free and more peer to peer. So like early, <laughs> early ideas. behind. <laughs> so these centralized real estates, you were already, already kind of doing. <laughs> Excellent. And, and tell us, tell us about your time at, at Google. Like I, I've always been impressed with, you know, people that have come out of Google to start businesses. I really feel like there is a, of all the, of all the big companies, I think there's a lot of, you know, a Mex, you know, the, the Zooglers X O O G L E R S who have, who have left to start things. I think there's a really excellent culture and, you know, I think just kind of vibe there that, uh, yeah, I think, uh, it probably changed the company, uh, changed over the years. Um, I was at Google back in 2000. 10 to 14 or something. So it, it was a different company. And already back then I thought it's way too big. So now I think it's even bigger. Um, I was attracted uh, by the culture, by just, um, you know, seeing like how tech products can be built, a consumer tech product. So I really wanted to see how this is done. And there was a small team in Prague that had this regional role opened. Um, and I absolutely loved YouTube many different reasons, community, you know, sharing content, consumer tech, innovative. So I was, I was attracted to that. Um, after, uh, after a couple of years, I, I really built really great relationships. I'm still in touch with many of those people, but I, I felt I have to leave because Google made me feel way too comfortable. I felt like this, is thick. <laughs> it's a company that is making a lot of money on an existing product. And it's just like having a good life, which I felt is dangerous to stay in, <laughs> in a position like that. So I don't know, it's just like some people like to suffer, I guess. So I left Google and I started to come to me from zero. So it's kind of like somebody said, move to New York, but don't stay in New York until you're too hard. And I think it's Google, go, go to Google, get some experience there. But if you start getting too comfortable, then that's, the message from above time to go on time to take your skills and go somewhere else. I mean, I, I do, I do not want to say uh, uh, that it was uh, uh, like, it would like fall negatively on anyone who's working at Google. Not at all. It was just that I felt that like everything's been taken care of. Right. So you have a nice uh, HR contact, like everything, like the company's making a lot of money. There's tons of offsides and learning and development. Like it, and of course, a lot of work as well and a lot of things to achieve. But at the same time, I felt like it's like I'm not putting myself like, <laughs> like <laughs> on the line. Yeah. It's like, you know, like nice incubated. <laughs> I'm, I've been in Bali for four years, but I spent 25 years in China as an entrepreneur. And every time I go to Silicon Valley, I would visit Google or Facebook or Airbnb or Twitch. And I would find a, you know, a person in there that I knew, come and have lunch, get some free snacks and just kind of feel the culture and like Google's it's not, it's not easy. It's challenging certainly, but there is, there is comfort. There's, there's really a high, a high level of comfort. It just doesn't, it's not a, a criticism. It's actually a compliment. But uh, the fact is if you want, if you want more, then you have to do things that your other colleagues who are telling you don't do it. Uh, then, then that's a, that's a, that's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. It, it, some people, if it scares you, then you shouldn't do it. If, if you're, if you're really, well, if it scares you, you should, you probably should do it. But if you can't get past that, then you're probably not made for it. But it, like you, if you're like, oh, I'm, I'm really motivated by that. That puts a fire under my ass. Let's go. Then, then that's, uh, it's, it's beautiful for, for both groups. T t tell us, tell us some of the challenges and trials and tribulations and triumphs along the way. Some of the if you could go back, you can't go back in time, but 
you know, talk to yourself eight years ago, some of the things you wish you'd done differently or some lessons you'd like to teach other people. Wow. <laughs> so there, uh, yeah, there are many different things. Um, I think that we should have been bolder with the global partnerships uh, from the get-go, right? It, it took us some time to like, can we do this? Can we do this? And then, then it was just a streak of achievements, like going to different uh, tech platforms, like I mentioned, the messengers. But then uh, we also went to global brands with some level of uncertainty. Will anybody listen if we, as a small company out of Eastern Europe, blah, blah, uh, propose a game to a global brand, will they listen? And they did. So just like, if I knew that I would have had more confidence from the start, you know, like we pitched a game to NASA, to uh, National Astronautics uh, Space Agency, and we did a game with them. Uh, and it was something I could not, like, I was like, this is never going to happen. And it did happen. So we did a game together with NASA that was played by 16 million people, one six sixteen, 16. Wow. And it was, I, I I wouldn't imagine. And it's just like, you go and you try and you really have to take the risk. It's like, it's gonna, like one of X shots like that will, will work out. But if you, if you keep trying and if, if you just go and give it a shot, there is like, what's worse than just hearing no, right? It's not so bad. So if, if I knew that I would, I would even double down on that earlier than, than we did. So we had this amazing streak um, of part global partnerships and brand partnerships like Guinness World Records and many others that then resulted into an award we got as um, one of the 100 most disruptive uh, brands in marketing, which we were not even in marketing or <laughs> gaming company. So it was just the confidence, like no matter where you come from, uh, and um, it, like Eastern European startup, woman led doesn't really matter, just you you can do that so the confidence level was one of the main i think like realizations like you just take it <laughs> you can absolutely go and take it <laughs> yeah like with nasa with nasa that's extraordinary i don't even know if other people even thought of it because maybe they were intimidated but you're right if you pitch them and they don't like it they don't strap you to the rocket and send you into an asteroid they just say no thanks or they say nothing right so it's almost like you you kind of can't lose in a way as long as you can deliver. And obviously 16 million downloads, you could certainly deliver. Can you share with us what happened after Apple pulled the plug on you guys and how, how, how you survived? Yeah, well, that was a massive, another massive learning, right? So, so the first moment was like, we're doomed <laughs> because we, we had a product. We don't have a product. So this, the second, uh, sec the second, second, I thought like, what am I going to tell my team? Right. Because they have been working so hard on making that happen. And now like I'm, I'm hearing from Apple on a phone call, like we're, we're removing your app from app store. It's a business decision. There's nothing you can do. I'm like interesting. And, uh, then of course, how do you explain that to your investors and still asking them to, uh, to back you right without the product? So there was a lot of thinking in like, how do I put it? Like the, the answer was obviously just be very honest. <laughs> like now we have, we had this, now we have nothing. So we have to figure out. Um, there was a moment where I, uh, where, uh, I took a lot of time thinking about what does it mean to not give up and give up and move on. So it's, it's called a pivot. But it's it, it's not really defined well because sometimes you you do not want to give up on the idea, so you keep figuring out like how do I how do I make my idea happen, and is 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 that a pivot or you just have to say okay this will not work out I have to find out a different idea and that it can feel like giving up to somebody who doesn't like to give up. So <laughs> then at that moment, when Apple pulled the, the plug, we understood we have to pivot, but it wasn't clear to me. And if I could come back to the situation, it, it would have been a lot easier for me to understand that it's, it's okay to change from one idea to another as a pivot and doesn't necessarily mean giving up on it because what we did for some time, we stick to the idea and we were figuring out how to make it happen, how to put the app back to app store. So using different ways, like, like technical way, like business network way. We even joined uh, Spotify in the, in their complaints to European commission of 
abusing the monopoly power of Apple. Like we were really, like, I was really like all in, like, we, like, I'm not giving up, we'll figure out. But I spent way too much time on that and it did not work out. So what I should have done instead, this is probably too big of a fight for us as a small company with a certain amount of runway. And the pivot does not mean like pivot in ideas. How do you get back what you lost rather than uh, well, like what, what else we do? And what, when, what did you do? What was the ultimate next step? A different product. And what was that product? So we basically changed the product. We changed the business model. We changed what was the problematic in Apple and we relaunched, relaunched the game in a different package, but it was a bit too late. We were getting at the end of our runway and it was super, super stressful for everybody. And so what happened? You're, you're right at the end of the runway. You got me and everybody listening. So well, right at the end of, right at the end of our runway, I had to go to our current investors and ask them to give me a funding on an idea because we did not have more time to build the new product. Uh, so I had to ask for funding on, on, a, on a new idea. On yeah, like a, a completely different idea. In a situation where they already funded the product, we lost. Yeah, completely different idea than they backed before, which was gone. So uh, fortunately, I had great investors and they said yes. But it was very stressful. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. So first of all, the way you described it was Apple told you Hey, we're pulling the pl the plug, and you said interesting. And in some ways, that is that is the answer. That is the answer because I can't control that. If I just scream, or if I feel like you said we're doomed, or my my friend calls it an ofio moment, O F I O. Oh, it's over, right? Then the team smells that, and everybody else smells that. Instead, you just go interesting, fascinating, and then. You're, what should I do? You are honest with the team. And in my experience, that's what you have to do. And the team will support you. And there, that's the way out is about being where this is it, guys. We, we burn the bridges. We burn the boats. We have to beat the enemy so we can come back on their boats or we're not going to survive. And everybody rises to the occasion. But then also the pivot, you know, you didn't really I, I think like truly pivot, like, okay, we're a mobile gaming company. Now we're going to be, you know, do utilities or we're going to create something like you are like, we just need a different, we need a game. We need, we're, we're still a game company. Let's oh, make stuff people want and th th that I, make stuff that people want, but then Apple will also, also allow us to do. And I, I, I love that you fought the dragon, but also it's a great lesson that you got to pick the hill to die on. Like if you're going to really fight the dragon, and you're like, let's go. Ah! And then you come up and you hit the dragon's toenail with a sword and the dragon. <laughs> mm. But now you live to fight another day. And now you are becoming a dragon, a force to be reckoned with. Gamey is like, you know, rising, rising up more and more. I love it. T tell us, tell us one last story, anecdote, lessons about the gaming industry is very male dominated and I think it's, you know, a superpower to be a female leader and to be able to do things, um, you know, in a, in a little bit of a different way. What, what have you done differently and learned along the way? Well, I do, I, I think it comes down to a leadership style that maybe, um, is more something that you can recognize in women is empowering others, but I'm not saying that like, of course, uh, men also have that leadership style. It's just like something that's very close to me that, uh, I just enjoy doing. And I sometimes, uh, you, you know, like you, you have like different mentorship sessions or you come in a circle of founders and they speak about like how you activate or like how you w make things done and what's their style of leadership. And, and I've always seen mine to be very different. And there were moments when I was like, hmm, should I change into something more? And then I was like, no, because I do, I have like, I'm spending so much time. <laughs> I'm spending so much time at work and I really enjoy that. Just, I, I just want to be, a, be the way I am without having to put myself in a position. Like, I don't know, like this style of leadership. So I, I became very relaxed and very happy with like, this is what it is. That's the package. This is how I lead the company. And, and it's really, um, very motivating to see it, it's accepted and, and I'm, I'm getting great feedback from the team. Uh, even if, if you look at the numbers, what's the churn rate, right? People don't really leave. They stick around for a really long time. So that's very f fulfilling for me. 
And um, well, uh, in terms of women in gaming, well, what can I say? There is uh, almost half of the gamers are women and most of the games are built by men. So my biggest contribution to the company is always that I will play the games and, and see if the, <laughs> if the women persona <laughs> is catered for. So we're trying, of course, to have more women uh, be part of the team. Um, and that's happening, but it's happening a little bit slowly. Love it. Thank you. Yes. Superpower indeed to really male or female show up as your authentic self. You have to be, you have to be yourself and you have to be aligned head, heart, gut. Otherwise it's just not sustainable. And I think also there's a lot to be learned. I think from a little bit more of a nurturing feminine side of, of leadership and my wife, that's sort of her expertise. And I think especially in a creative industry, you need to be able to have that and to be able to give this space for people to show up as the, as the best version of themselves. And, uh, and, and then also, like you said, more than half the game, I think it's more than half of, especially casual gamers or women. So, so what, it's like, you know, they were doing crash test dummies and they were all men and then, okay, great. Yeah. That, that, that works. Um, well, the car is safe for a, a male version of a crash test dummy because all the people that did the crash test were all men. But if you put a female in the car, they're getting injured because nobody's thinking about, well, wh what about the female frame and how does that work lower down on the steering wheel and smashing, smashing their face. Right. So I think there's a lot of blind spots in, uh, in gaming from the male dominated industry that I'm really glad that somebody like your bad ass self kick ass self is, is, is filling that gap. It's amazing. I love it. And I, 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 I celebrate you. It's improving a lot. I would, I have to say every time I go to a gaming event, I see more and more women. So that's very, it's very exciting. Excellent. Amazing. Hey, Bozina, thank you so much. I continue to be a big fan of you and your company and the games that you're building. And I look forward to seeing continued growth. Wow. I can't believe that you guys are already in the deep into the billions of gameplays and there's going to be, you know, hundred billion, uh, is, is the next target and looking forward to that. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Kaboom town. Wow. That is an inspirational and kick-ass web three builder entrepreneur. Thanks for listening everybody. Please see LS comment, like subscribe, and we'll see you at the next founder insights podcast. Thank you. This podcast is for information purposes only and should not be considered as financial advice. Any opinions provided in this podcast reflect the views of the speakers only.